my name is Sharon Terry. I'm president and CEO of Genetic Alliance. This uh, webinar is part of a series of webinars we're doing this year on how we as advocacy organizations can really take the bull by the horns, really drive um, the research and really become uh, the, the kind of central entities with regard to research. We're, we've been through, as most of you know, and, and if you don't, you can go to our, our library, our archive, or our YouTube channel, uh, a whole series of webinars on registries and studies and on community engagement and so forth. And we're really pleased today um, to have Mark Kaczynski with us from Quality Metric, who will share with us about one of the most critical pieces of what we can do as advocacy groups now that we've been successful in lobbying uh, like crazy and getting PDUFA 6 and then PDUFA 7, uh, part of the, which is the FDA Authorization Act to actually include the patient voice in a very serious way. And it's now required. So uh, what we're trying to do at Genetic Alliance is make that easy for you. And Mark is part of how we make it easy for you and still have it be of the utmost quality. So Mark, I'm gonna turn it over to you now. Um, you can share your screen and we can get started. Great. So um, thank you, Sharon, and uh, thank you everyone for uh, attending this morning, this afternoon. Um, I just want to start by apologizing in advance. I've had chronic hiccups for four days now, and um, so I'm going to sound a little interrupted in my speech. Uh, I'm not drinking or anything like that. I'm just <laughs> dealing with a, a bad case of, of hiccups. So um, let me see. Let me get to... Okay, can you see the uh, slides or yes. the slide deck? Okay, let me put it in a presentation mode. Great, and everything looks okay, cool. Yep, looks great. So again, thank you very much. Yep, thank you very much uh, for inviting me uh, today to, to speak about um, burden of disease and uh, how we measure it. And uh, I will focus uh, specifically on a specific measure uh, that has been used for decades to be able to do uh, relative disease comparisons, as well as to promote the patient voice in clinical research and clinical trials. So I will focus on um, measuring health status or what we often refer to as health related quality of life. Now, uh, often you hear quality of life being thrown around uh, as a general term uh, in, in what what we measure though is, uh, is the, the health component of quality of life. Quality of life is a very broad topic and concept and, um, and, and not, not uh, defined well by any one instrument because of uh, the breadth of concepts that you would have to cover in an instrument to really measure what is considered quality of life. So we are focused, very focused on the health component of quality of life. So what are health status measures or health-related quality of life? I mean, the, the guiding principle or definition comes from the World Health Organization, to which I'm sure you're all um, very familiar with this statement of uh, health being a state of complete physical, mental, social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. Um, that has, that definition has really shaped how we have uh, developed patient reported outcomes of measures of, of functional health status over the years. What we are measuring is what people are able to do, which is the function and component. How do they feel? The stress and well being, uh, energy fatigue, and then their own personal evaluation of health, general health perceptions, health outlook. How do I compare to others like me? Uh, these form uh, th these three main. Uh, concepts form um, the majority of what we call generic health uh, instruments uh, that measure health-related quality of life or health status. Um, the, the, the use, development, and interpretation of, of PROs and health status measures um, has been guided by a conceptual uh, model that was introduced by authors Wilson and Cleary, Cleary in a JAMA article back in 1995, where they specified uh, four specific uh, areas that you could uh, measure health outcomes. 
the first being obviously clinical markers of a disease. So if you're thinking asthma, spirometry provides you with uh, a, an objective measure of lung function. The second level of this model is, is symptoms. Um, and this is where patients uh, or it, individuals first experience an abnormality in a clinical marker of a condition. So this, these symptoms for, if, if spirometry was out of a normal range, uh, a symptom that a, a person could experience is shortness of breath, and which is often measured in asthma studies, uh, either as frequency and or severity. At the next level of this model are what are the disease specific in, impacts of the disease and its symptoms. So this gets at um, not measuring what short, how much shortness of breath you have, but what is the impact of shortness of breath in your ability to live life, uh, whether it's uh, daily activities or just overall enjoyment life. But in these specific measures, you give specific attribution to either the sim symptoms and or the disease when describing uh, functional impact. And then the far right of this model are what we call generic health instruments. So these instruments uh, are not developed with a the specific disease or population in mind. They measure common and most relevant uh, health dimensions that cross cut across all different types of populations and therapeutic areas. These two boxes on the, on the far right of the model, um, the, the health composed uh, are, are constructs that can, uh, are commonly uh, used to uh, develop uh, health related quality of life in instruments. Um, and uh, not surprisingly, through decades of research, th the measures in these two far right boxes of the model are some of the most uh, predictive measures or best predictive measures of future health consequences, such as inpatient uh, and outpatient medical expenditures, uh, the likelihood of losing one's job in the near future, can identify those who are more likely to respond, respond to treatment, identify those who are able to return to work, as well as predict uh, mortality. So the, they're very important measures in under, understanding um, uh, other uh, consequences due to uh, morbid associated with disease. As I mentioned, there are two different kinds of health status in instrument. Well, I should say from a broad, broadly speaking, two different kinds of health stat instruments. Those are generic health surveys, uh, which tend to measure physical functioning, social role functioning, energy fatigue, mental health, and general health. But from a standpoint of having no attribution to disease or specific symptoms uh, so that they can be apl applied to, uh, to all types of populations and diseases and um, enable researchers to establish a common currency by which to compare relative burden of disease across conditions. And then you have disease specific surveys, which more often than not focus on specific aspects of a disease and or provide attribution to functional deficits to the disease under, under study. Um, the most widely used uh, generic health instruments uh, globally are the SF36 and SF12 health surveys. Um, these instruments were uh, first developed back in the late 80s. And I'll kind of give you a, a little bit of a genealogy of the development of these tools uh, towards the end of the presentation, but uh, these tools have been uh, studied throughout the world, um, rigorously validated both uh, clinically as well as lingu linguistically to ensure th uh, that data from different languages are comp <laughs> comparable, excuse me. Um, they're standardized uh, so that we score these instruments in a standardized way uh, to preserve uh, the ability to interpret uh, across different populations and therapeutic areas. They've been widely used throughout drug development and uh, uh, device uh, studies, um, as well as in a large population health surveillance studies, and even in clinical care. Um, we're, we're currently involved with several uh, large-scale uh, oncology clinics that are using 
these tools as uh, point of care uh, vital signs to understand um, the burden of treatment and or, uh, or the cancer uh, uh, therapy. These tools measure uh, eight uh, overall health domains that are summarized into two uh, summary measures, physical and mental health. And we've adopted what we call a norm-based scoring or a standardized scoring such that the mean of the general population the, uh, or the norm is set at 50 um, uh, and, and therefore individuals who score below 50 are, are doing uh, worse off than uh, the normative population. Those who are doing uh, scoring higher than 50 are doing uh, better than the normative population. Uh, so by building it, um, a standardized scoring, there's uh, ease of interpretation without having to go to a manual or go to the research to know whether a score is above or below normal. Um, so quickly, the genealogy of the development of the SF tools dates back as far as uh, the mid 1970s with the launch of the health insurance experiment, which was one of the largest social uh, experiments conducted in the US to uh, gather information on attitudes and health outcomes related to uh, uh, fee, fee for service and or uh, free care. Um, the, the next study, uh, the medical outcome study conducted in the late 80s to early 90s, this is where the actual items and survey itself was developed. So the health insurance experiment, the preceding study, uh, including booklets of questionnaires with five to 600 questions that individuals had to complete to be participating in the study over a two to four year period of time. Um, obviously, if at the time getting uh, patient reported outcomes into, uh, into uh, more wide uh, scale uh, studies and initiatives, you can't uh, consider a four or 500 uh, question uh, item questionnaire. So the medical outcome study, one of the, the key goals was to try to come up with short forms and make measures more practical and precise um, and, and without loss of validity or measurement precision uh, with shorter uh, forms. The medical outcome study also included 150 items in the, in the questionnaire that was used over a four year period of time. Um, to study uh, uh, practice styles and outcome and variations and outcomes between fee for service and managed care amongst the chronically ill population. The survey uh, covered over 40 health concepts and through qualitative research with patients and or uh, key opinion leaders who were participating in the study, we were able to narrow down to, to eight, eight health concepts that were deemed to be most relevant in describing the patient's experience of health. And those are the eight health concepts uh, that were uh, developed around uh, for the SF36. So we were able to reduce 150 items, 40 health concepts down to uh, eight health concepts and 36 items and, and be able to demonstrate um, high reliability and uh, clinical uh, validity uh, without much loss in measurement precision. So we basically made the tool more practical for more wide scale adoption in clinical trials and population uh, health initiatives. The next study uh, was the International Quality Life Assessment Project uh, launched in the mid 90s with support from pharmaceutical industry. The whole goal of this uh, initiative was to develop a methodology for standardized translations of, of health status tools and uh, a, a process for validation in determining the quality of translations. Um, this basically internationalized uh, the SF uh, Health Survey to be uh, a, a primary measure in global multinational trials at the time. And then lastly, the Medicare Health Outcome Survey, which was launched in 1998 and still ongoing right through now into 2023 and 2024. This is a, a CMS initiative 
that was launched as a result of results from the medical outcome study where we showed that four-year outcomes of patient, of chronically poor and um, elderly uh, population do significantly worse in managed care organizations compared to fee-for-service organizations. Based on uh, the results of that study, CM CMS launched the Medicare Health Outcome Study as a way to monitor two-year two outcomes amongst uh, Medicare recipients in managed care. That in initiative launched first with the SF36 and now uses a, uh, an adaptation of the SF36, which is the VR12. This is the measurement model for the SF36. So we have 30, 35 of 36 questions within the survey that aggregate up to sc the score eight uh, uh, domains, physical functioning, role, physical, so role limitations due to physical health, bodily pain, general health perceptions, uh, vitality or energy fatigue, social functioning, role limitations due to emotional health, and then general mental health. And then through some psychometric evaluations of these eight domains, uh, we determined that we could, re uh, could reproduce or, or summarize these eight domains with two uh, overall summary measures of physical and mental health, which uh, account for 85 to 90 percent of the reliable variance in each of the eight scales. The the whole purpose of going to a uh, to two overall summary measures was to help clinical trial investigators who deal with the uh, uh, issues of multiple comparisons in evaluating treatment effectiveness or e efficacy. So if you can reduce the number of comparisons from eight to two. Your, your studies are powered better um, in, in recognizing uh, treatment efficacy without having to adjust uh, your significance le level due to uh, multiple comparisons. Um, so we, we adopted a standardized scoring metric, and this is really the, the, the heart of, of the adv advantage of these tools when standardized scoring uh, is made um, part part of the uh, of the assessment. So um, through the years, um, we've taken uh, great efforts to develop our general population data sets and disease specific databases uh, to uh, facilitate the interpretation of scores uh, from the SF36 and SF12. So we're able to communicate back to individuals how they are doing relative to individuals uh, of their same age and gender and or uh, having the same condi conditions and or comorbidities. And having this ability uh, enables uh, researchers, patients, uh, individuals, and uh, in, in clinical trial investigators to better understand uh, uh, burden of disease and make inter interpretation of these somewhat unfamiliar metrics when uh, studying a specific, specific population. Uh, next slide. This is just a short list of some of the uh, uh, diseases for which we've est established benchmarks. Um, right now, we're over 100 uh, different therapeutic issues or diseases for which we have uh, established benchmarks uh, for, the, for interpreting SF scores. We also have uh, general population norm normative data um, in five uh, EU countries, J Japan, Brazil, and China. Uh, so we've, we've done quite a bit work to expand our interpretation guidelines to uh, to be not just US centric, but um, um, uh, globally, given that this instrument is, is widely used in randomized controlled trials. Um, in our last count, there's over 8,000 published studies on the SF36 or SF12 being used in randomized controlled trials, which is, um, a very useful database for clinical trial investiga investigators. The, uh, the, the more broader um, bibliography of SF36 studies, SF12 studies, 
we're approaching 50,000 published studies uh, on the use of this tool across various applications in the healthcare space. So those publications provide, um, you know, uh, some valuable interpretation guidelines across many different therapeutic areas as well as applications of the instrument, as well as independent validation of uh, empirical validation of these tools in, in many different uh, study circumstances. Uh, next slide. This one is kind of pieces itself together, but this kind of is going to wrap up what what it all me it all means. So the standardization allows for interpretation. So pulling it all together. Um, um, this looks like a humpback whale, but it's actually the distribution of physical summary scores in the general population. Um, and we see that it's kind of skewed to the right. So there's many more individuals scoring better than 50 uh, in the population, but the average adult scores 50. The average adult without any uh, condition uh, scores scores 55, roughly a half a standard deviation or a moderate effect size difference uh, from the total population. If you hit the next uh, button, by having uh, disease specific benchmarks, we get to understand how does congestive heart failure, chronic lung disease or diabetes impact physical summary measure uh, of the SF36. We can see that congestive heart failure failure patients score roughly at 34, which is about two standard deviations below the average well adult or one and a half standard deviations below the average adult in the general population. And relative to diabetes and chronic lung disease uh, uh, show uh, much greater physical functioning burden uh, than those two other, <laughs> excuse me, other conditions. Uh, can you click the next button? Uh, by having the standardized metric and profiles of scores, we also get to understand um, mo movement of, of, treat, of uh, physical health um, pre and post treatment in, say, a clinical trial for asthma. So prior to treatment, asthmatics score uh, roughly 44, which is uh, a little more than a half a standard deviation below the average adult or a full standard deviation below the average well adult, and those would be moderate to large effect size differences and clinically meaningful. Uh, after treatment, patients are approach uh, the average score in the general population with a score of 49. You hit the next slide, next button. By having um, these pr predictive studies that have been conducted over the years, we get to also provide additional interpretation of that five point improvement in physical functioning before and after asthma treatment. We know through uh, other research and Lincoln scores uh, to disability, it re represents uh, a 50% uh, reduction in, in physical disability, a 33% reduction in likelihood of being hospitalized in the next three months, a substantial increase in work productivity and significant reduction in predicted uh, medical expenditures. So the standardization and, 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 and um, enforced since standardization of scoring of these tools allows for uh, or facilitates for more rich interpretation of scores uh, that can translate um, what a score of 40 means into something clinically meaningful um, and, and, and relevant uh, <laughs> to understanding say treatment benefit and or uh, being able to to help individuals understand how they're doing uh, relative to others who are like them in terms of clinical characteristics or uh, demogra demographic characteristics. And I believe that's the last slide. Let's see. Yes. Okay. So thank you. I, I kind of threw a lot out there. Uh, hopefully it was or organized in a way to follow because uh, it did kind of shift gears uh, between describing the instrument, the, the genealogy, and then some of the important attributes of the tools to aid in interpretation. Great. Thanks. You, thank you so much, Mark. This yep. was very, very helpful. 
Um, question in the chat. Can you discuss how the SF36 V2 relates to patient reported outcome measures and how they are used in clinical trials? So I'll start with the lat latter one because that one's easier. Um, so how the tools are used in, in clinical trials, um, you know, for, for decades, PROs have been used in clinical trials, but it's only been in the last uh, 10 to 15 years where the FDA has put an emphasis on capturing patient experience in cl clinical trials. So um, there's been a significant uptick in positioning PROs uh, into uh, secondary or key secondary efficacy endpoints in clinical trials. Previously, they've been mostly nice to have uh, exploratory endpoints suitable for publications, uh, but not suitable for going the full uh, route of getting a, a PRO label claim. So now you'll now we're see, seeing an um, uh, an increase in the number of PRO label claims. So for example, an example of a, a label claim in rheumatoid arthritis using the SF36. In the label, it states improved. Uh, uh, general health status as measured by the eight domains of the SF36. Now, uh, that enabled by getting that claim in the label, that enables uh, the the pharmaceutical company to uh, to market that message that that their product not only reduces disability related to rheumatoid arthritis, but it also improves overall general health status, including physical function and ability to return to work mental health status, energy, and fatigue. So many uh, trial investigators are, are bringing PROs into clinical trials. Number one, they have to, um, but two, they're now um, elevating the importance of the PRO to be key secondary or secondary efficacy endpoints. In, in some therapeutic areas, it's a primary uh, efficacy endpoint. So, you know, migraine research, <laughs> In migraine uh, trials, it's re they rely heavily on PROs as being a, a primary endpoint, uh, in addition to uh, reduction in head headache days. How does the SF36 relate to other PROs? It's a rather broad question. I'll start with what I know, and then maybe uh, you might have a, a an additional follow up question. Um, so. Um, the, the SF36 is often used as a criterion measure to validate new instruments. Um, so studying the relationship between a new, newly uh, developed instrument and one with a history of, of, of validity. Um, uh, so particularly if the instrument is measuring relevant concepts uh, and, and or symptoms, um, because symptoms have a great impact on functional health and well-being. So often the tool is used to validate uh, new, new tools that have been developed uh, to measure uh, disease impact and or uh, symptoms. Um, from a more broader standpoint, how they relate to other PROs, um, it, again, it re really depends if you're focused on generic health measures versus disease specific. Over the uh, recent years, there's been a movement towards specificity. So you see a proliferation of disease specific measures. Uh, there's still a very good correlation between SF tools and, and disease specific measures, but you know, the, more, the more that there's con conceptual overlap, the greater the correlation when there's a lack of con conceptual overlap, uh, the relationship uh, tends, to be, tends, tends to be weak. And then lastly, I, I, I'd like to mention that um, I'm sure many of you or some of you have come across uh, PROMISE, which is an NIH-sponsored uh, instrument development project um, that was launched back in two 2003. Interestingly, um, Quality Metric was founded in 1997, um, and we were the first to come to, to, uh, uh, to the market, so to speak, uh, with computerized adaptive health assessments. So we kind of laid the foundation for Promise and all that NIH funding. And in fact, the SF36 items are core items in many of the Promise tools that have been developed uh, over the years. Uh, but that's, a, that's a, uh, an NIH sponsored, excuse me, sponsored initiative that um, 
has sponsored the development of disease specific and, and general health status tools, both um, from using short, short form static fixed length surveys or bu building item banks uh, to uh, deliver health assessments through a computerized adaptive uh, methodology. Great, thanks Mark. Uh, couple more questions. Amber, I'm gonna answer your question uh, in the last five minutes because we do have a slide for that. Uh, meanwhile, Mark, this is a big question for our community uh, because as you know, many, many rare diseases uh, and common ones are um, pediatric. And so the question is, what about the use of um, SF36 V2 by caregivers? Uh, completion by proxy does not look like it's recommended based on research this individual could find in caregivers of older individuals with physical disabilities. How about children, parents of children with developmental disabilities who never develop verbal language? Yeah, great question. Um, so the SF36 um, and the origins of the SF36 uh, have been administered and invalidated in populations as young as uh, 12 years of age. That said, um, it's primarily an adult uh, instrument um, 18 and over. And, and the reason why I say that it, several of the concepts, the content uh, would not be highly relevant to a child population. So if you look at the role scales, measuring you know, ability to perform at work or school or, or other daily activities, we would have to modify those questions to, to be more age appropriate. Um, um, during the development years of the SF36, um, uh, one of my colleagues, Gene Landgraf, um, built the child health questionnaire using the same conceptual framework as the SF36. So there are other good instruments out there that are more appropriate for child health and, uh, and caregiver reporting of functional health because they align and measure concepts that are, are probably more important to a child and, and, and younger population than what's captured by the SF36. So we know that there, there are hundreds of studies that have been published using the SF36 in, in children. We just don't recommend it because of some of the uh, conception the con concepts are not um, uh, re relevant as currently stated and would need modification. And, and despite the hundreds of studies being published, there's really never been any systematic uh, validation of the tool in those younger populations to, to feel comfortable in wanting to use it in the younger population. Thanks, Mark. Uh, does SF36 help address uh, patients' financial burden, mental health, and family impact? So kind of a loaded question because this tool itself wouldn't help with family impact, but it wouldn't uncover um, those who are struggling with mental health problems that may fall under the radar. Uh, so for example, the SF36 mental health scale has been shown to be an effective screener for depression, major depression and anxiety dis disorder. So there are thresholds to identify patients who are struggling <laughs> With emotional well-being that could impact family and/or their ability to function. I'm um, sorry. The, the rest of the question, I'm not sure I captured all of that. Uh, so financial burden and mental yeah. health. So um, we have linked the SF36 to medical expenditures. So we can. Uh, there are thresholds that um, that have been drawn for the SF36 physical uh, summary scale or determining who are likely to, to burn more medical expenditures in the near future. So uh, um, in using those uh, cut points, um, our, our popu population health clients use that to identify future uh, adverse health events and try to manage uh, expenditures going forward by identifying those who are, are at high risk of future medical expenditures. Does it help the patient or the individual financially? Not directly, but by identifying them sooner 
uh, before a, a catastrophic health event occurs um, uh, with a score on an SF tool or a, an instrument that has similar predictive validity. Um, you can intervene sooner and uh, prevent uh, future medical expenditures from, uh, from incurring from an unmanaged condition. And, and why, I, why that's so important is in, in our population health clients, they typically rely on retrospective claims data to identify those who are at risk for future health uh, expenditures. The problem there is there's a significant lag in claims data um, and it doesn't cover all those who are at the highest risk. Not everybody seeks care and they wait until a catastrophic <laughs> health event happens before they seek care. By that time, it's too late to intervene. So uh, these measures help uh, population health uh, initiatives by identifying those outliers who are at greatest need or at greatest risk for future expenditure, but who aren't popping up on the radar from claims data. Great, thanks. Uh, and so then a number of questions in the chat um, about what tool would be best for rare disease pediatric patients. Um, and of course, Mark, you know, that's a huge audience for Genetic Alliance. And so we would be very interested in hosting that tool in, in our system with Luna as well. So uh, it just happens at a, an event um, this Friday, Please, uh, it's it, it's somewhat confidential, uh, but it a new it, it will be announced at the end of the week or early next week. We've acquired um, the Child Health Questionnaire fran franchise, which uh, has a suite of general health tools for measuring child health as well as infant toddler health, um, and they. The concepts, if you look at the concepts of those tools, uh, they closely align with those of the SF36. And one of our goals in acquiring this tool and, and accumulating data over time is to bridge the measurement and interpretation between these tools. Because one of the, one of the biggest challenges right now in the f field of patient reported outcomes is you have different tools for different age ranges of population, but none of those tools talk to one another each other. So once somebody ages out of one tool and goes into the next, they're administered a different tool. And even though they may be measuring similar concepts, they're not cross calibrated so that you can compare what life was like in the previous age cohort to what life is like now in the current age cohorts. So one of our goals in acquiring uh, this these suite of tools is there, there is considerable conceptual overlap, but then we want to track individuals over time who have taken all of these tools and develop a, um, a cross calibration algorithm that would allow you to do more appropriate evaluation over time, even though the instrument, instrument may, may have changed to be more age related. Okay. Excuse me. <laughs> And, and Mark, we'll speak with you about uh, what we can do to get the, yep. some of those hosted on Luna so that they're accessible yep. here. Okay, cool. Yeah, because this group, this is, there's 120 people registered for this webinar, so they'll all receive information about it. And there's been almost 50 people here. All of them are fabulous at being real boots on the ground for reviewing things and you know validating things and so instruments and so on. So I think there could be some great collaboration between us and you. Absolutely, and and we rely on groups uh, like you all to um, you know we have blinders on when we when we study reliability and validity issues and development of measurement. We need your feedback to understand what are the paint points in, in applying these measures uh, in, in real world. And, and, uh, and I think that's probably one of the, the, uh, the gaps in instrument development is involved in that type of, of feedback during the development process as, as opposed to developing and then getting the feedback after the fact, because I, I think it could really shape how measures are developed and or, uh, or implemented. So um, we we are excited about you know this collaboration and and working with you all to uh, make measurement more practical but usable not just by 
stakeholders, but by the individuals themselves who are participating, because at the end of the day, it's their voice that needs to be heard in a standardized way, and that can be translated uh, to something meaningful to various stakeholders, and that's our goal here. Absolutely wonderful, and really aligns very well with ours, of course. Any other questions, anybody? You can unmute or write it in the chat. And, and Sharon, if, if questions come up after the fact, after we're yep. done today, please compile them, send them to me, and uh, I'd be more than happy to, to address them and send you an email of, to the best I can how I can uh, answer each of the questions. Wonderful. That's fabulous. Um, I'm going to put up a slide now on how folks can participate in this uh, offering. Um, so essentially, and you know, I clearly understand that for the groups that have mostly pediatric members, this is difficult. However, because of the way Luna is structured, we can also parse this by age and by um, a lot of other factors. And so you're still welcome to use this. As Mark said, it has been used um, a fair amount and uh, more than more than hundreds of times. Um, and so um, what we're really interested in is, aggregating across all the conditions, the burden of disease. This is a project I've been working on with the International Rare Disease Research Consortium, as well as others. We're also um, very clear that, and this goes to the question that was just posed, um, how can this help the FDA understand? So the FDA is requiring per PDUFA 6 and 7, which are the authorization acts, uh, this kind of data, patient reported outcomes on the burden of the disease. And I can tell you quite clearly, because I'm in the middle of a bunch of, P of FDA meetings for pseudoxanthoma elasticum, the disease my kids have that lots of you know how, that's how I got started in this business. Um, and it's been amazing to me that uh, all the work I've done all these years to convince the FDA that it's really what's happening physically and functionally and, and quality of life to people that makes the difference, they've heard us. And it's really kind of biting me in the, in the back because um, I have some very concrete measures of blood levels of certain things in PXE that do not yet correlate to function uh, because PXE takes 30 years to progress. And so I need a 30 year clinical trial to show FDA the very thing that I've fought to get uh, to get done. So I, and I'm not at all disparaging that we have gotten to this point and FDA is paying attention. So a study like this is something you can bring. And in fact, I'm really working hard to make sure that the PXE members are, are answering the survey because we can bring this data to our next uh, meeting with the FDA to show them this is the burden of disease on people with the condition. Because one of the things they said to us is we're not sure that there's really a burden, even though people are visually impaired, legally blind, they can't walk and so forth. Um, and they need data to show that that's true. And, and this sort of study brings exactly that data to them. So how to participate. Um, and we're going to send this to you in email. So you can click on these links. You can invite your members or clients in the case of <laughs> universities and hospitals to the study with the, with the um, common referral code. You can request a special referral URL unique to your organization. Just email me. I can set that referral up in one minute on the system, on the Luna system. Um, that would allow you then, allow us when we do the, the scoring and then do the uh, reporting out to be able to report out by that specific referral URL. Um, if you'd like your own your own group or community on Luna's platform, you can email collaborations at lunadna.com. It takes about a day to set up your community. It's very fast. You would not need to go through IRB approval because this study has been approved by the IRB. Uh, there's also a number of other studies in the library uh, in Luna uh, instruments that you can use without IRB approval and or you can go to Genetic Alliance IRB, which is cheap and takes about 24 to 48 hours, so very fast. Um, the Luna Library does have a lot of validated instruments in it, um, and so you're welcome to, uh, to use those as well. Um, if you currently use Luna for your registry or your studies, you can adopt something called the Cross-Condition Burden of Disease Study. So you'll see that in there. 
uh, I've placed it in a place that's public so that you can adopt it and just put it into your queue for questionnaires that um, uh, surveys that you're doing with your members. And then if you have any questions, you can email me. And as Mark said, I'll compile those and send them to Mark uh, if they're for him and if they're for either me or Luna. Um, Dawn is on here as well today. We're happy to answer those questions uh, too. And Mark, to your question, will data specific to our diseases be shared with us? If you use a specific URL, uh, if you have me give you a, a referral code, then yes, we will be uh, able to parse that out that way. If you don't, we probably can. We also have in there alongside the SF36V2 a, um, a, a survey, one question survey on what conditions do you have? So somebody could indicate that they have the condition that you're working on, and then we can put that together as well. So those are all sorts of things. Uh, there's a lot of things we can do with this. We're really grateful that Quality Metric is going to score this for us so that we do have this done in a very official way. And then how much we can uh, churn out in terms of uh, analysis will depend on um, how, how we, Genetic Alliance, can find funding to do the research, because we would need researchers to do it. So if you have somebody interested, we can talk to you about that, either writ large or for a specific condition. Um, and uh, we're also interested in anybody co-sponsoring this. And I don't even mean money, although I love money. I really love money. Um, but I mean uh, that, you know, if another umbrella group or another coalition of diseases or whatever wants to say, um, that they want to co-sponsor it, then that would be great. Uh, the question, if we are not on Luna, can you explain the process would be like for our community members once they use our referral link? Yes, they do have to sign up for the on the platform and sign the consent. Absolutely. In the age of GDPR, CCPA, hundreds of um, HIPAA and um, uh, Office of Human Research Protection uh, um, regulations, absolutely nobody should be collecting data without having someone go through the consenting process. The system is extremely secure. Luna's recently been audited for GDPR uh, and for a whole host of other uh, country specific and state specific, um, uh, 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 sorry, just got a message and got distracted, state specific um, and laws around privacy. And so the, the, the information is very, very secure and people do sign up and decide uh, themselves how much they wanna share and what they wanna share. So yes, they, your individual members would be creating an account. It's their account. They make decisions about what to do with their data. They can connect to their own EHR. They actually can connect to 700,000 portals in the United States. Um, which is quite convenient for families that have many portals, many EHRs, they can see them all in one place. Uh, and then they also can uh, upload any kind of genomic information they have. So it's a kind of one-stop shopping for, for families, for parents, for, for individuals, uh, and the person controls where their data will be used. So yes, that's part of the system. We have a whole webinar on that, which we can, uh, we can give you um, uh, the link to. And then if this is collected in a registry, would the individuals have to duplicate taking the SF36? I don't know if I understand your question. So if you already have the SF36 in your registry, then you don't need to do this. And we can talk about how to bring your data into the bigger picture when we write the big paper to tell the FDA that we're all suffering tremendously and need to have rare disease uh, uh, access to, to regulations and so on. Yeah, so if you've already licensed the SF36 and you're using it, bravo, um, you see today how powerful it is. Congratulations for that. And what we're trying to do is just give everybody else who hasn't licensed it um, and who doesn't have the scoring for it that access, which is really quite remarkable. So we're at the top of the hour. Mark, I want to thank you so much for this collaboration. I think the sky's the limit, and this is just the beginning, and I'm really looking forward to everything we can do together. Well, thank you, Sharon, for inviting me. I really enjoyed uh, being able to present today and certainly want to be a resource to everyone on the phone if you have follow-up questions. Wonderful. We'll, uh, we'll make sure that they can connect with you. Thanks, everybody, Excellent. for coming today. And... Uh, See you soon on our next webinar, right. I hope. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.